Okay. Uh, Mark, whenever you, whenever you want to start, Mark, go ahead. I've, I've started recording. Excellent. All right. Well, I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to the One World Mind Seminar uh, this Thursday. Uh, well, morning here, uh, afternoon on the East Coast, and late at night, <laughs> where our speaker, uh, Russell Luke, is. Uh, thanks for making the time. Um, professor Luke um, is a professor at the Institute for Numerical and Applied Mathematics at the University of uh, Göttingen, which I probably just pronounced terribly. Uh, he's an expert in optimization methods, and the far-reaching impact of his work literally reaches to the stars where his numerical algorithms uh, for adaptive optics will be used in the new James Webb Space Telescope, uh, which will be replacing the Hubble. Um, in a in addition uh, to his research work and applications, he also currently serves as an editor for several journals, including the Journal of Optimization Theory and Applications, the SIAM Journal of Optimization, and Advances in Computational Mathematics, among others. And uh, finally, uh, he has done a lot of other very interesting work in his career outside of mathematics, including working in the film industry, producing documentaries um, and more. So. I encourage you to visit his website and uh, look at his papers and, and read his bio. Uh, you can find the titles of the movies that you should watch tonight there. So having said that, I'll turn things over to uh, Professor Luke now. Thanks, Mark. <clears throat> um, uh, thanks for that. Thanks for that. But nice introduction. There's a few clarifications. Like, so the movies, uh, to call it the movie industry, the part that I was involved in is, would be an overstatement. I was. Uh, with a community who was hell-bent on never ever making any money from any movie they could ever possibly make. Uh, and I worked for free and was living in somebody's basement while I was doing all that stuff. And so those movies you won't find uh, in digital format yet. They were all made uh, prior to the big digital thing. But, but, um, but maybe, uh, maybe I'll, uh, I'll digitize those, those things. And Put him up. Uh, we'll see. And then the other thing of the James Webb Telescope, um, I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure actually that that my algorithms won't be on the 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 uh, the, the telescope because the algorithm that I wrote was thousands of lines long using uh, very sophisticated um, nonlinear optimization techniques, and I'm pretty sure they just went with the very very simple stupid techniques, which I will talk about in this talk. Um, and, so anyway, um, but and then also I have to apologize to Galland, who is in the crowd. I'm get, this very first slide is going to get me into trouble. I should also be mentioning mentioning the uh, the Kaduyeden colleague, uh, our um, uh, research training grant uh, 2088, uh, which is also funded. Some of the research I'll be talking about in here, uh, for which uh, Galland is the speaker. So uh, apologies, Galland. I, I know I'm going to be got an earful about that tomorrow. Um, so let's see, let's see, I'm gonna see, how do I page down here? Uh, no, this is working, okay. Basic uh, outline here, I, um, the first part of the talk is gonna be pretty didactic. And then the second part, I will really, really quickly go over some of the, some of the advances that we've um, made in the last uh, few months. Um, um, and I'll try to keep things sort of concretely anchored to uh, these kinds of problems, either systems of, of linear inequalities, actually linear equalities, uh, just solving AX is less than or equal to B. And, and uh, for my talk, uh, the interesting thing will be that, that the, we'll have the M will be less than N. So we'll have more unknowns than we have equations, which means lots of solutions, uh, but still, will run into to problems with that. And then the other problem that I'll talk about sort of abstractly is I call the cone and sphere problem. Um, and that is just the problem of finding a point that's nearest in some sense to a cone and to spheres in the image of, of affine transformations. And this covers problems like phase retrieval, uh, which is the connection to the James Webb Space Telescope, and then also uh, source localization and other problems uh, like that. So uh, mathematically, the system of linear inequalities would, would look like, like this. You would, you would just, uh, for each linear inequality that you have, you would describe sort of a, a, a set. And, and actually, this then describes a, a half space. Um, and to solve the system of linear inequalities, you're just looking for some point um, 
in the intersection of all those half spaces. And I'll talk about that in a second. And then the cone and sphere problem uh, has this sort of format. Uh, you've got a, a linear mapping, these script FJs that are mapping. Um, so RD to the nth power. So this is like a product space of d-dimensional spaces. So an n-dimensional product space of d-dimensional spaces. The thing I have in mind is uh, the d is just two. So it's uh, a product space on the, of the complex plane. Uh, and so this is a linear operator uh, with that from those this space to itself, basically, uh, or, the, or a space with the same dimension. <clears throat> and um, and at each each element in uh, each uh, j or each i going from one to n, where we have specified uh, some some magnitude given by this bij for the um, jth sphere uh, that, that's uh, under the jth linear or affine transformation. And all we're doing is that we're specifying that at, at each of the i components that we lie on a circle of radius b. Um, and then, so those are the, that's the sphere part of the cone and sphere problem. And then the cone, I reserve uh, the set C naught for the cone. So that, and a cone would be like a support constraint is a cone, a non-negativity constraint is a cone, a sparsity constraint, at least in Rn, is, is a cone um, symmetry also. So uh, in, in my mind, um, a lot of the algorithms that you see for solving these kinds of problems, um, I, I like to, um, I think that, that the, the algorithms should be actually categorized by the underlying model that's inspiring those algorithms, even though oftentimes when you read papers, it's not exactly clear. <laughs> uh, certainly when you go into the physics papers, it's not really clear. Uh, what problem they're solving, they just specify an algorithm. Um, but the most primitive of the model categories is, is the feasibility category. And, uh, and that's just ask, that's asking very little. It's just finding, asking to find any point that satisfies the constraints that you specify. It doesn't have to be the best point, just any point. Um, and um, actually, I, I find that modeling uh, paradigm for myself to be the most flexible and most powerful, really. Because anytime you want to, you can have an algorithm that solves problems like this. And every time you decide you want to add a new constraint, you don't have to change the algorithm. You can just describe that constraint by a new set, add in the set, and then, and then your algorithm can stay basically the same. Um, uh, the, the next level uh, up from that is a product space formulation where you take each of the constraints and you put them sort of alone in their own space. So the constraints are all sub, sub, subspaces of, of some, uh, some n-dimensional space, say. And um, or on the previous slide, uh, d-dimensional space. And, um, and then uh, you can, you can say, okay, I'm going to satisfy this constraint here. I'm going to satisfy the next constraint in a parallel space, a parallel universe. And then, uh, and then for all of those different copies of my, my universe, I've got this set D, which basically tells all of those parallel universes uh, to communicate. And what this is, is the diagonal of the product space. And so I'll say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to be in each of these, these sets separately. But then I'm looking for the point that is also in the diagonal of the product space, meaning that, that the point that's here is equal to the point that's there, which is equal to the point that. So basically, when I solve this problem, I'm exactly solving this problem, but just in a product space. And what, I, what I've shown in, in uh, some work with Mark Taboul is that actually this is a kind of a hidden way of smoothing this problem. And that's another point about these, is these are sort of non smooth model. Um, paradigms. There's there's no differentiability here. There's no function that you can that you can easily sort of take a derivative of or anything like that. Um, and so so that actually is why these two formats you don't often see in a lot of optimization literature. Um, uh, and what you really start to see, you, you, a lot of the optimization lit literature starts with a problem like this in the third category, which is just smooth optimization. 
And so I can put these two um, first categories into this format by just saying, well, instead of finding some point in the intersection of these sets, I'm just going to find some point that minimizes the distance, the square distance to each of these sets and sum this up. Um, and so this is very nice because you can, this is, you can compute derivatives of this, even second derivatives of this. And so this is something that would be much more kind of um, familiar to people with just, you know, regular university optimization. This is where you would first start with. And then the, the fourth category, constraint optimization, this just covers everything. And any variational formulation minimize a function subject to some constraint. So, so these are the four categories. And, and, um, and I've often you know, spent a lot of time trying to convince people that the first category, just the feasibility framework, um, is really powerful, and oftentimes it suffices, and, um, and it delivers uh, much faster algorithms. So uh, back to our algorithms, let's, let's start with the, the fourth category, minimizing uh, constraint optimization problem. Uh, I can formally make that look like, like an unconstrained optimization by introducing these indicator functions. So this is a function that takes the value zero when I'm in the set omega, and otherwise uh, is infinity. So I have to allow myself in, uh, infinite valued functions. And this looks like an unconstrained optimization problem. This is, but it's an unsmooth, it's a non-smooth optimization problem. And usually we assume that f is differentiable, but this thing is non-smooth. So, but nevertheless, given this, this problem, um, supposing that this were just your regular unconstrained optimization problem, what do you do? You, you, you compute the gradient and set that equal to zero. Okay, well, there's a non-smooth version of that, and that is the gradient uh, generalizes to the subdifferential. So we want to compute the subdifferential of now this objective function, which is here. And that's so the subdifferential just generalizes that for non-smooth functions. And we now this is a set. So instead of finding zero equals assigning a point x where zero equals that, uh, we're going to find some point x where zero is in that set. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, this is the part where um, anybody designing algorithms is going to start because uh, this is like this is a generalized equation and computers actually don't solve optimization problems. They solve gen they solve equations. Um, so <clears throat> but uh, this is just an optimality criterion. You know, any any point that satisfies this optimization problem has to satisfy this condition. But any point that satisfies this condition doesn't have to be a solution to the optimization problem. So, so anyway, nevertheless, we'll continue with this. So this is our equation that we can then uh, kind of plug into our computer and try to figure out how to solve. And when we put it into a, into a computer, unless we have an exact solution to this generalized equation, we're going to solve this iteratively. And so when we start, start solving things iteratively, we set up a fixed point iteration. <clears throat> And so then we change we change our equation to a problem uh, to a fixed point problem. Find some point x in the fixed point set of some operator t. And and then from a fixed point equation, we set up a fixed point iteration, <clears throat> hoping that this is a reasonable thing to do and that this operator t is reasonable. Now this operator t is the algorithm. And you can, you can cram any complicated looking algorithm into this T as long as it's parameter free in the sense that you don't, you don't adjust or optimize the parameters at each iteration. You just fix a parameter and let it go. Uh, and, um, and this is, I'll be talking about this. You can certainly accelerate things, but the theory that I developed for this is, is, is meant so that if I can show you how quickly this fixed point iteration converges, or even that it converges at all, um, any acceleration or improvement that you add on to that should only do better. Uh, so I'm just sort of providing like the worst case performance for this. So the main question, however, uh, when, when I, I work a lot with physicists, and um, they usually start down here. They have some algorithm that they run, and it's a reasonable thing to do based on physical ideas. Um, and sometimes they say, oh, yeah, that's related to some variational problem, if ever. Um, but, uh, but, but this is the main question, starting with a fixed point iteration, <clears throat> when can I follow these implications upward? You know, when can I say that 
this fixed point iteration has anything to do, will find a fixed point of my operator. And when does the fixed point of this operator correspond to an optimality criterion? And when does that optimality criterion, which, which optimization problem does that optimality condition correspond to? So when, when this function f and the set omega are convex, uh, and the set and the space, the model space X is linear, usually you can start with your fixed point iteration and, and everything works and you don't have to worry about being able to carry these implications upward. Things are usually pretty nice. But when F is non-convex or the set's non-convex, omega is non-convex or X is a non-Euclidean space, then these implications break down dramatically. Um, and it's very, very difficult to say when and if a fixed point of this operator corresponds to any optimization problem and whether or not your fixed point iteration converges. So, um, so I also in the title, I, 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 I mentioned um, proximal splitting. So um, a splitting algorithm, I wanna mention what that is. So I've talked about you know, uh, just a fixed point iteration this would be the uh, an acceleration of this fixed point iteration. You've got some parameter alpha that, if if the alpha changed at every iteration, then you would do this. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, so you can play with this basic fixed point iteration. But what the uh, splitting part means is that t is a composition or average of either resolvents or descent mappings. So what is a resolvent? So let's start with a descent mapping. A descent mapping, which in this model is, is the G, that's just something like you know, the negative gradient. <clears throat> you can compute the gradient of a function, you take its negative, and you go in that direction. So that would be a descent mapping. Um, the resolvent is uh, of this descent mapping would be the inverse of the identity plus the gradient. And uh, if you do PDEs or uh, differential equations, a resolvent, if you look at this, corresponds to an implicit step. This would be the implicit Euler step in this case. And a descent mapping corresponds to an explicit step. That would be your explicit Euler step. Okay, so that explains uh, operator splitting. Um, I'm always gonna have to assume that my fixed point mapping is non-empty. I'm not gonna get existence proofs directly out of this stuff. Uh, but I wanna now come back to um, two uh, concrete examples to fix all of this. So let's move away from uh, linear inequalities to just linear equalities. Um, I wanna solve AX equals B. I've got more unknowns than equations. Uh, so I have lots of solutions, <clears throat> but I'm an optimizer. I told you I like the, the feasibility way of modeling things. So, so putting this into a feasibility framework, I'm gonna look at each, each row of A multiplying X equals one of the elements of B. That's just describing a hyperplane, these hyperplanes. Um, and so the solution to this problem is finding uh, a point in the intersection of the hyperplanes. Uh, and that immediately suggests a, a very, very simple algorithm because I, I know how given any point anywhere, I know how to compute the projection onto this hyperplane. It's a, it's a formula that you work out in, in uh, linear algebra. And so when you're teaching the first semester uh, numerics course, uh, you could show this to your students. We often, we never do actually, this, this way of thinking about linear systems of equations, but you could show this to your students, have them in a homework problem, uh, calculate, formulate the closed form for the projection onto that mth, uh, hyperplane. And, and then you can, you can first project onto the mth hyperplane and the m minus one and so forth up to the first hyperplane and repeat. And that is called cyclic projections. And, and there's a convergence theory for this. Uh, it goes back to von Neumann. Uh, von Neumann proved that cyclic projections uh, converges to the point nearest to your starting point in the intersection of these hyperplanes. And Aronson showed that that convergence uh, rate is linear, um, either linear or finite uh, from any starting point. So this is a reasonable thing to do. And then you have your students code this up. It's very easy to code up. Um, and they'll do this. So you give them a random matrix that's dimension 50 by 60, and the students code this up and they get these results. Now, I don't know if you can see this on your screen well enough, but you get something that looks like really nice linear convergence up until 10 to the minus 16. And then you see wiggles here. 
don't pay attention to this uh, graph on the right. I'll, I'll explain that in a second. Um, now, uh, and the students say, uh, what's that? And you say, oh, right, um, that is round off error, right? Um, well, we didn't talk about round off error in the theory. The theory just said that this converges either, I mean, this is an exact computation, right? So, all right. And there's a, we can think about errors and often, if not always, the way people think about errors is just some, you just add some error term to the end, right? I think of, I'm computing the exact projection onto the thing I really theoretically wanted, and then I can't get there exactly because of round off errors, so I add some epsilon. And then the convergence theory is like, okay, A is full rank, then the cyclic projections uh, with vanishing errors converges to some point in the intersection. With vanishing errors, that means these epsilon k's have to go to zero which is tantamount to saying computing with no error because uh, nobody ever increases their numerical accuracy. I, I defy anybody to. I mean, I know um, uh, David Bailey, who uh, I co collaborated with on the, the, an experimental math book, he does computations with 20,000 digits of accuracy, but he doesn't go to 200,000 digits of accuracy. Um, so, but this still doesn't explain this because I'm not in, in improving my accuracy, but one of the points that I've, uh, the, the, uh, the dividends of the, the theory I've been pursuing explains this and says that, no, it's, this is not noise, actually. You're converging to something. And what you're converging to something is indicated by the plot on the right. What the right plot is, is a histogram of successive step uh, differences. And this is a, a histogram on the order of 10 to the minus 16, I think. Um, and so the, 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 dis, the distances are, you know, there's a small variance, 10 to the minus 16. No physicist would, would worry about that. But the interesting thing is that this is, this is a distribution. This is not random. And, and even though round off error follows some IEEE standard, um, this is looking like this histogram of, uh, of these distances between successive iterates. I took the, like, the last like these iterates and then just did the histogram on that. Um, uh, they're, they're behaving like random variables with a distribution indicated by this, this histogram. And actually that's what one of the dividends of the theory is that I can, I can prove that actually. Okay, that's the first concrete problem. Second concrete problem, this is the common sphere problem. Uh, this came to me from Tim Zalde at, at, at the Physics Institute here in Göttingen. <clears throat> this, uh, picture on the, on the left was a, a diff optical diffraction image that his undergrad students took. And he gave this to me and he said, um, okay, this is a diffraction image and the object exists somewhere in this yellow box. Uh, so I have these set, I have one set that is described by C C1 describes these spheres um, that are specific where each pixel in this image is is a, a bi, and so we're specifying this is the intensity of a complex valued uh, function in that plane, um, and so so uh, I'm in the complex plane which I model with R two, and I have 128 uh, pixels. Actually, it should be 128 squared, sorry. Um, <clears throat> and my, my cone is just, is this set. Uh, it's the set of, so 128 uh, squared. Um, the, 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 uh, the cone is the, the set of non-negative uh, real valued uh, numbers. So that, that exist somewhere in this square. Um, so the most efficient methods, uh, and, and this is the right community for this, I'm going to try to be, well, I'm going to be a little bit provocative on this. I've, there's been a lot of work on phase lift, solving phase retrieval problems and Vertinger flows and things like this. Um, and uh, despite all of the attention that those kinds of algorithms have gotten, um, you have to beat one of these three. One of these three algorithms is the algorithm to beat for this problem. Um, and it's, it's extremely hard to beat these algorithms. And, and oftentimes what I've seen people do in the literature is they get away from 
from doing comparisons against these algorithms because they say, oh, well, they get stuck in local minima or not much is understood about, about their behavior or something like that, and that's wrong. Um, they, they, um, they work really, really well. Uh, sometimes they do get stuck in local minima. That is true. Doesn't happen often, um, but we do understand a lot about everything that we need to know about these algorithms, except I cannot prove global convergence, but I'll talk a little bit about that. So just showing some graphs. So we, we uh, together with Matt Tam and, and Tao Nguyen, uh, who were at Göttingen, um, we applied cyclic projections to this, just projecting on the C1 and C0. Uh, and we get these, this kind of linear convergence locally. Um, again, we, we can't really, this is just luck, you know, uh, uh, but, but we can prove that you have to get local linear convergence of these methods. Um, but the, the graph on the right is the interesting one, is the feasibility gap. Now, this the steps are converging to zero, but uh, the feasibility, this is the gap between the C0 and the C1 set, which you can compute the distance at, at a particular iterate. How far is that iterate to set C0, and how far is it to C1, and you sum that, and you get this. And so this is telling you that the problem's inconsistent, that, that, that in fact, the, the measurement and the and the constraint that we set up, the C0, they don't intersect. Um, and you can, you can sort of do a numerical proof of that by applying the douglas ratchford algorithm to this. And the douglas ratchford algorithm has some interesting properties. It's, it's the favorite one, actually, for a lot of, a lot of people. Um, and, it, and it takes so many different forms. It's, it's, it's known as um, uh, a Phenops algorithm in physics, and uh, the cyclic projections is known as Gertrude Saxton. Um, but but Douglas Ratchford is a, a shapeshifter. It takes a lot of different forms. Um, and the interesting thing about this is that it doesn't converge to anything. And you can prove that it can't if the sets don't intersect. And so this is sort of numerical verification that, yeah, the sets don't intersect because this isn't converging anywhere. And you look at the gap, it's not achieving the gap, it's sort of coming close and then goes away. And, this, and if you watch this, it'll, you'll see it just kind of cycling around and going nowhere. And then this relaxed Douglas Ratchford uh, algorithm that I proposed back in 2005 for handling that, that problematic aspect of Douglas Ratchford um, uh, then recovers convergence. And um, together with uh, Anna Martins, I was able to prove that locally, yes, you, you have to converge linearly. We see that. And we see also with this, that with the relaxed Douglas Ratchford, we, we um, uh, achieve the gap. And um, so these pictures, they don't look like anything. Uh, obviously, it's a very low resolution diffraction image of a coffee cup. Um, but uh, this is as good as it gets with, with this undergraduate data. It's, it's, it's real data. So our goals for this, there are lots of questions you can ask about these processes. But you know, when I started all this, I was just given these algorithms and these graphs and asked to explain them. Um, so, and that's what I'll talk about today is um, basically given a fixed point iteration like this, when does it converge to a fixed point? Uh, how fast? Does it converge to this fixed point? And when I stop, the, the really critical thing is that since these are iterative methods, when I stop at some iteration, how far am I to the set of fixed points? Um, and I can only get that if I know a rate of convergence. So I need a rate. And there are other questions you can ask about, you know, what's the correspondence between the set of fixed points and critical points of some optimization problem? which when you're just faced with a feasibility problem, it's not clear what that optimization problem should be. Um, and how do you construct a fixed point mapping an algorithm such that you will converge to a critical point? That's, that's a big question you can ask, and a lot of people um, focus their energy on that. But then even further, uh, if you're uh, in the non-convex world, um, when does the set of critical points described by this co correspond to the, the argmin of some function. And uh, this optimization problem, how do you compute the subdifferential? Uh, does the subdifferential um, distribute across summation? Uh, how do you compute? Because you want to solve zero is in this subdifferential. So actually what you want to compute is the inverse of that at, at zero. So lots of things you could ask on this end. 
Um, I'm going to focus on the, the bottom part. OK, so now we're getting into the, to the more um, technical things uh, that we've been developing recently. Um, and now, so I have to explain a little bit why I'm working on these exotic p uniformly convex spaces. The intuition was, if you go back to the cone and sphere problem, um, you know that the point, the points you want lie on these circles. And um, so one of my ideas was maybe I could I could uh, get around the the fact that these these circles are non-convex because they you know the the middle doesn't belong to the to the set. Um, one way around that would be if I formulate the problem or analyze the problem on the space where those iterates have to have to lie. And so they're lying on these spheres. And that is a well understood space. That's a, 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 a cap, kappa space, so a space with uh, curvature bounded from above. So uh, my idea was, OK, study the, study the algorithms in these nonlinear spaces where something that, that looks non-convex in a Euclidean space might be convex in the nonlinear space. Turns out um, that I, nothing comes for free, actually. I, then things break down in the nonlinear spaces that are fine in the Euclidean space, and I'll briefly mention that. So a p-uniformly convex space this is my basic um, uh, model space for p from 1 to infinity. Uh, a metric space is p-uniformly convex with some constant c whenever it's uniquely geodesic. So um, geodesics are um, um, paths, shortest paths between points. Um, and at any three points, x, y, and z, this inequality is satisfied. And you're taking a convex combination of x and y here and looking at the distance of that convex combination with z uh, to the p power. And, and this, this distance is bounded above by when you separate out all those pieces, the distances between z and x and z and y and x and y. Um, so examples of this, when p and c are two and the space is linear, so you have an inner product and things like that, um, then you're just, you have a Hilbert space. Okay? Uh, a Hadamard space would be p and c are equal to two, uh, but you don't have any linear structure. So that's called a cat zero space. And a ka kappa space, uh, spaces with um, uh, curvature bounded uh, uh, from above, uh, the p there is two, but the c, the constant c here that comes in there, is, is less than two, and it approaches two as the kappa goes to zero. So these are some examples of these. Um, distances and projectors, just, just to, to be clear, the distance to a set is just, it's the solution of an optimization problem. It's the infimum over all y of this problem. This is the indicator function uh, to the set omega of uh, y. So given some point x, I want to find the, the point in omega that's closest to x. Uh, if that point is attained, so in particular if omega is closed, then we talk about the point where that distance is attained as the projector or the projection. The operator that sends us there is called the projector. Okay. Um, and there are nice properties uh, um, of projectors in particular. When C is convex, then the projector onto that set is pointwise alpha firmly non-expansive. I'll have to define that in a moment, and I will, um, at points in C. Uh, the projector is also a singleton when C is convex. Uh, it's a big open question whether the property of this being a singleton actually characterizes convexity. That, that's not known uh, in most uh, interesting spaces uh, other than Euclidean spaces. Um, uh, the projector under a sphere, so just, just to show you that it's not exotic to, to um, come up with projectors that are multi-valued, all you need to do is imagine the sphere. So a sphere with center Z, radius rho here, the projector onto that sphere is given explicitly by this. And if, if you're, you happen to be at the, at the center point, then the projector under the sphere is the whole sphere again. So that's the multi-valuedness. And it's, so it's, this is not an exotic thing to get multi-valuedness. Um, so the projector is neither point-wise alpha firmly non-expansive, I'll explain that in a moment, nor is it everywhere a singleton. Uh, the inverse of the projector is just a set of all points that send me to uh, the point Y. <clears throat> uh, 
OK. Um, now, projectors are a special case of another uh, main mapping that shows up in a lot of algorithms, and these are the prox mappings. Now, in, in nonlinear spaces, I have to expand these to what I call p prox mappings, and the p indicates the, the nonlinear space I'm in. Um, so in a complete p uniformly convex space, the p proximal mapping is the, the solution to this optimization problem, minimize f of y plus this scaling of the distance of uh, x to y. So the x is the anchor point. And basically it says, you know, I want to try to uh, minimize the function f, but not go too far away from the point x in the metric d uh, and with the power p. So examples of this, again, are the, the if, if the function f is the indicator function of a set omega, then the prox, the p prox of the indicator function is just the projector onto the set omega. Another example uh, is the subdifferential resolvance. If we're in Rn, and we've just got a Euclidean uh, distance, then the prox of a subdifferentially regular function, all that, all that means is just says the subdifferential is well-defined, it's non-empty, and uh, you don't need to worry about anything. Um, so the prox uh, of f, you now uh, p is 2. In fact, this is a subset of the resolvent. This is why resolvents are so important. It's the subset of the resolvent of the subdifferential of f. f doesn't need to be smooth. Uh, and, and that is just defined as the set of all uh, points y, where x is in y plus the lambda times the subdifferential. Um, so that's the connection between subdifferential and when f is convex, this this inclusion here is actually inequality. But when you're in the non-convex world, you have to worry about the thing is that we can we can usually come up with formulas for this side, and we just have to be aware that these formulas might not be points that are actually prox points because the prox is defined as, as the ard min. Okay, uh, set value mappings. This is just technical just to, um, uh, for people who haven't seen this before, I denote it with these double arrows. And um, it's, I'm not really worried about the topology of the power set. I'm just taking a point and just, it's a recognition that this point gets mapped to lots of points in, in my set, uh, uh, my set Y, for instance. And then I can define an inverse mapping of that uh, just as, as another set. And the, so the domain of a set value mapping is the set of points where the mapping is non-empty. Um, that's the only discrepancy between functions that we're used to, because the domain of a function is where the function is finite valued. Here, the domain is where the, where the mapping is non-empty. OK. Uh, so but one interesting thing here is that fixed points of set value mappings, how do we describe that? Well, it's just, it's just any point x such that x is in the image of t of x. The t of x can be a whole set of points. Um, as long as that point is, is in that set, then we call that a fixed point. Um, and that, that can lead to problems, because that's not, pretty, that's not very well specified. Um, but when I add a property to my set value mapping, pointwise almost non-expansiveness. So I'm on my way to this alpha firmness that I mentioned on previous slides. If the mapping, the set value mapping is pointwise almost non-expansive at a point, that means that there exists some epsilon such that now x plus and x naught plus are the images of x and x naught under t. Um, and they're just selections from the image. Right? Any selection from the image of these points, uh, the distance of those images, image points is less than or equal to the, the p root of 1 plus epsilon times the distance of the, uh, of the points themselves. And notice the point wise is coming from the fact that this x naught is, is fixed there. I'm only allowing x to vary around d. So, <clears throat> and if epsilon is equal to zero, then we just say that it's um, almost, uh, then it's said to be non expansive. Uh, right. When epsilon is zero, then it's non expansive. And uh, right. When, when this property holds for all x naught in D, then we can get rid of the point wise. So um, the interesting thing about this is that mappings that are point wise almost non expansive at some point x naught uh, are single valued at that point. And you can see that from this inequality. If t 
were multi-valued at x naught, then I could take uh, point x in the image of t. <clears throat> uh, I could take, uh, yeah, I could take, uh, so it would be x naught and x naught here. So this distance would be 0, because those are in the pre-image. And then I could take a different point x in the image of x naught under t. And this, so this would be a non-zero part uh, thing, and this would be zero, and that can happen if the mapping is pointwise almost non-expansive. So that gives a single valuedness of the operators right away at interesting points. Um, so what are these almost alpha firmly non-expansive mappings? It's pretty much like firm non-expansiveness, uh, um, almost, uh, almost non-expansiveness, which I just, on the previous slide. Um, uh, take the peak power of both sides, and you would have what we had on the previous slide. But we're adding this, this term here, or subtracting it, okay? Where this, uh, this uh, uh, psi of, of t here, what is this? This is something I call the, the transport discrepancy. And basically what it does is, if you've got a point x, and you've got a point x naught here, then you look at some the image point of x and the image point of x naught. Um, let's just say that these are single valued at the moment. So I've got this parallelogram and the negative parts in that expression for the, the, the psi of t are these distances uh, and the, the positive parts are all the blue distances. So uh, what it's, it's looking at is the discrepancy between the sum of these distances on the boundary of this parallelogram and the diagonals. Okay? And when you're in a Hilbert space or a Hadamard space, this quantity, this guy, is always positive. So subtracting off something positive means that almost firm non-expansiveness is a stronger property than non-expansiveness. Um, but if you're not in a Hadamard space, and you're in a you're in a space with positive curvature, then this psi guy can be negative, and that causes everything to go uh, crazy. Okay, on Euclidean spaces, uh, then this alpha firm non-expansiveness property shows up everywhere. Uh, if you've got a convex function, the prox mapping of a convex function is alpha firmly non-expansive with alpha equal to one half, no violation, not pointwise. Uh, projectors are alpha firmly non-expansive with alpha equal to one half, uh, because projectors are examples of, of prox mappings. Uh, projectors onto smooth manifolds. Now we're not assuming any convexity. These are almost alpha firmly non-expansive on neighborhoods with violation arbitrarily small. So that violation epsilon, I can make that as small as I want as long as I'm close enough to the manifold. And that's a way to, to cause the, I call it a violation because we want this epsilon to be zero for our convergence uh, analysis. And as long as I can control how large that epsilon is, uh, I get a local theory out of this. Um, so uh, an example now, uh, also uh, uh, steepest descent. F is just any smooth differentiable function, doesn't have to be convex. Then if you can control the step length, then this mapping is also almost alpha firmly non-expansive with the violation arbitrarily small for a small enough step, uh, lambda. So I can, I can control this. On p-uniformly convex spaces, things get, get bad. Um, uh, the prox mapping for f convex is only pointwise almost alpha firmly non-expansive. We have a violation there, even for a convex mapping. That's bad news. Um, <clears throat> and so we showed that. Uh, recently in a paper with uh, Arian Berlima and, and my student, both were students, uh, Florian Lauster is still a student, um, uh, just, just this year. Uh, projectors onto convex sets, however, projector is a type of prox mapping. These are actually pointwise alpha firmly non-expansive, no violation uh, with constant alpha equal to one half. <clears throat> that was one known. Um, and then um, this, uh, there's a convex combination of, of a prox mapping and the identity. This is the really the nonlinear um, analog to steepest descents, if you choose this f correctly. Um, then you know, what I'm calling this is nonlinear gradient descent with a step length. This should be beta. 
uh, is pointwise almost alpha fermi non-expansive with constant and violation dependent on this beta. So I can, and, but it's also dependent on the curvature of the space C. So <clears throat> what are some elements of the fixed point theory? Now our algorithms are splitting algorithms. They're compositions and convex combinations of mappings like this that have this property, pointwise almost alpha from non-expansiveness. Now the question is, is that property preserved under compositions and convex combinations? And so what we could show in some in a series of recent papers that are coming out this year, hopefully, both of them, um, that uh, when at points where the fixed points of these operators coincide, okay, then you have a calculus for this. Then this property is preserved. Um, uh, and, and that's in the most general setting. In cat zero spaces, you don't have to be at points where the fixed points of these guys um, correspond. Um, but anyway, that, that, that means that we can apply these ideas to all of the leading algorithms, which are splitting algorithms, um, to, to problems of interest in nonlinear spaces. Um, and in convex settings, pointwise alpha firm non-expansiveness at fixed points is all you really need to prove convergence of the algorithm. Maybe to get rates, you need more information. The next um, technical uh, ingredient in a convergence analysis is, um, uh, is uh, this, this inverse regularity. It's, it's technically it's called metric regularity. Um, and this is a very technical definition. I'll help you cut through the, the technicalities here. Just look at this and pretend this row is a constant. It's a, I'm more generally thinking of it as a gauge, which is a monotonically increasing function that takes the value at zero, uh, zero at zero continuously, uh, and otherwise is monotonically increasing. But pretend for the moment that this is just a constant and take this T inverse and just call it F, okay? And then call, and then this F of, sorry, F, sorry, um, this one is F of uh, T of X here. Where, okay. So what this inequality is describing is Lipschitz continuity of the mapping F. Um, where you know f is acting on this is f of y, this is f acting on that. So it's, it's just Lipschitz continuity with a constant row, okay, or gauge row. So what metric regularity is uh, is is actually um, Lipschitz pointwise Lipschitz continuity of the inverse of t at a particular point in the image of t. Uh, a lot of people have studied this. I'm a user of the theory. Um, uh, so if you're interested in, in exploring this more, check out these papers. Uh, this has lots of other different forms called, uh, that you might have heard of, like the Kardikilojosevich inequality. Um, that is a special case of metric regularity. Um, so putting all these ingredients together, we get an abstract convergence result, which has slowly kind of evolved since uh, this, this 2018 paper. Um, and uh, so remember the transport discrepancy uh, psi mapping that was used in defining alpha firm non-expansiveness. So we've got a set value mapping, self-mapping from D to D, uh, boundedly compact technicality. Uh, we have to assume that, the fixed that it has fixed points. And so we're going to assume that this mapping is pointwise almost alpha firmly non-expansive at fixed points with the same constant alpha on the, uh, and arbitrarily small violation on small enough neighborhoods. So I can control that violation. And this script TS, which is some, it's, it's, it's built from the transport discrepancy. Okay, now S here is a set of fixed points. So this simplifies uh, in a lot of cases to a very, very simple expression. But in most generality, it's, it's this. But if we assume that this script TS is metrically subregular, um, four zero on D with gauge rho, uh, meaning it satisfies this inequality, then, so these two under these two assumptions, then for any starting point close enough to the fixed points, this is a local theory, 
the sequence, the fixed point sequence, converges in the metric D to some fixed point with a rate characterized by this rate of metric subregularity rho. Special case if the rho is a constant, let's call it kappa. And the kappa, now the alpha and epsilons here, these are involved in, in characterizing the uh, almost firm non-expansiveness of the operator T. And this is the metric subregularity. So if the metric subregularity constant falls in this range, then for all fixed points close enough to the set of fixed points, or all starting points close enough to the set of fixed points, the fixed point iteration converges to a fixed point R linearly with the rate given explicitly by this. So here's your constant of metric subregularity there. This is your alpha constant in the alpha firm non-expansiveness, and this is your violation epsilon. So everything's explicit. Um, and from this, okay, if, if R, if R is in fact Q linearly convergent, then actually you can get an a posteriori error bound, which says when you stop at iteration K, you can say exactly how far away, or you can give an upper bound on how far away you are from the fixed point. So the proof of this is actually very easy. You just start with the inequality defining metrics of regularity. You insert the inequality associated with alpha firm non-expansiveness or almost alpha firm non-expansiveness. Um, and that gives you that gives you immediately just just inserting the definitions gives you convergence to zero of the distance of the iterates to the fixed point, but that doesn't give you convergence of the iterates to a fixed point. To get convergence of the iterates, you need to show that it's a Cauchy sequence, and that for that you need properties of the uh, the metric in metric subregularity. Can I uh, can I ask? Sir? So uh, verifying almost alpha firm non-expansiveness is a master's thesis. Uh, and ver verifying metric subregularity or finding problem classes where that holds is a PhD uh, thesis. Uh, but we've shown that it's actually necessary. So metric subregularity is necessary for convergence with the rate that you desire. Um, so, and this is also shown up in, if you're familiar with the Kardika Lujosevich, uh, everybody assumes that the KL property holds and then they get convergence with a rate, rate related to that. This is nothing different than that. Okay, so this explains uh, explains the, the graphs that we get for the Conan sphere problem, for the phase retrieval problem here. Uh, very in, in great detail, we show that you have to see local linear convergence of cyclic projections and of the relaxed Douglas uh, um, algorithm. And also we can prove that Douglas Rashford will never converge because it can't for inconsistent problems. Um, for the, uh, and this is all in a, in a Euclidean space actually. Um, back to the system of linear equations, actually, I'll, I'll finish with this, and, and so I've only got a few more slides. Um, that actually requires the most technical overhead, and, and actually lifting this simple under first semester numerical analysis class to, you're going to lift that setting to a space of probability measures. So, um, so my, my metric space here is just a Hilbert space where the operators are acting. Um, and I've got, and what I'm imagining in my, um, in my uh, pro cyclic projections algorithm for solving the, the system of linear equations is actually um, every time I explicitly compute the projection onto the hyperplane, I, there's round off error. So I imagine actually that I'm computing an exact projection onto a randomly selected hyperplane that reflects that round off error. But my projection is exact. It's just that the projector that I selected was random. And coming from this possibly uh, uncountable, in fact, in that example, uncountable index set. And so I've got these projectors. Uh, each, each individual one has its own little round off error and that's an exact thing. And then I construct a Markov operator uh, from this random selection of these, of these projections on the hyperplanes. Um, and so the Markov operator has a kernel that's you know, characterized by this. So this is the, the, the gener transition kernel. It's the probability given some point x and a subset a in the, the sigma algebra, um, the probability that some random operator t acting on x will uh, send me to a. Uh, and then I'm going to define, now I've got a transport discrepancy for this. 
uh, but now it's a transport discrepancy of a, of a random operator. So I can take an expectation of that. And I define an analogous object to this thing up here, but in the, in the measure space setting. And what this is, I've got, this is a this is couplings uh, between the probability distribution uh, on this random variable and this random variable. Uh, and these are the optimal couplings. So optimal transport comes in here. You have to be able to do a computer an optimal transport problem in order to compute this in femum. Uh, and then this is the infimum over all invariant measures. And so, um, so what I imagine when I'm doing my cyclic projections algorithm, I imagine I'm just doing a random function iteration like this. Okay. And I'm thinking now of my points that my computer is sending me, not as actual deterministic points, but actually selections from a, uh, from a distribution. So they're random variables. And so this you know, corresponds exactly to a, a Markov chain. Uh, and so given some initial distribution, every time I apply my Markov operator, I get a new distribution. And, and then the question is, does that distribution converge to an invariant distribution of my Markov operator generated by this, uh, this uh, transition kernel? Uh, and we can show uh, the, the general theory for that is this, this models this, um, basic result here, but now everything's in a, in a, um, um, a measure space setting. So we've got um, these randomly selected operators are almost alpha fermi non-expansive in expectation now with some constant. There's no violation here. So, oh yes, actually there is an almost here. So there's a violation. Um, and that's, this has this characterization very similar to what we had earlier. And then this transport discrepancy object uh, is metrically subregular. Here, metric subregularity applies immediately, but now with, with the Wasserstein metric, V2, um, W2 is the Wasserstein metric. Uh, and this is the space of uh, uh, probability uh, distributions um, that exist in uh, W2 on D. Um, and so as long as this inequality is satisfied, now this is just a constant here with this constant uh, greater than these, this expression, which is coming from the, this property up here, then we get that the measures, given any starting measure, the sequence of measures from our Markov chain converge R linearly to an invariant measure with this rate, like this. So that's what that is, with exactly this rate, which we saw on an earlier slide. And if the invariant measures, uh, if this just consists of a single point, then we have Q linear geometric convergence. And that actually we proved in an example in this paper. Uh, with uh, Neil Hammer and, and Anya Storm. Uh, we're, we're going through the first round of revisions on this. It took a while to get the reports back on this. It's a very long paper. Um, but basically, we showed an example that we can actually prove that this, this interpreted as a, as a Markov chain uh, must converge Q linearly to an invariant measure. Uh, and we could even calculate the rate for this as well. So um, with that, I'll just sum up. There are lots of questions uh, that you can follow up on on this. Uh, and um, so in p-uniformly convex spaces, the, the prox mappings are assumed to have common fixed points. Um, what happens if they don't? You need to work on that. So that's what I call the inconsistent case. Uh, also in p-uniformly convex spaces, when does metric subregularity come for free? Uh, so again, things like semi-algebraicity, we're looking for properties like this that we can apply easily. Uh, again, p uniformly convex spaces. Uh, we want to now just we want to apply these algorithms on manifolds and nonlinear spaces. And I have some some applications that I have in mind, but I'd, I'd really be uh, interested in seeing other applications where we can apply this in both the p uniformly convex spaces and Wasserstein spaces. Um, I was assuming that my mapping was single valued. Actually, uh, I need to deal with the technicalities of a, of a multi valued map. Uh, again, in both uh, settings, when does the set of fixed points correspond to critical points and of what optimization problem? Uh, and again, in both of these spaces, how do you characterize critical points? A subdifferential is not an easy object to deal with in, in this setting. And I, I'm not aware of much work in that direction. In Wasserstein spaces, this opens up a whole uh, new world of algorithms for Monte Carlo, um, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. 
uh, people who aren't familiar in that world with Douglas Ratchford type algorithms or others. So there's lots of, lots of testing of ideas coming from the proximal splitting community that can be applied here. And then also in Wasserstein spaces, uh, my uh, direct interest is applying this theory to randomized algorithms for uh, femtosecond X-ray tomography and machine learning. So with that, uh, I'll stop. Sorry, uh, took a bit. Uh, and thanks for your attention and just some of the papers that are coming out on this 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 one and this one are the ones that just appeared will be appearing uh, the papers with Neil Hammer and Anya Storm uh, we did the consistent case that appeared in 2019 the inconsistent case is the hard one that's why it took so long and um, other other papers upon which this is based so thanks. <laughs>